You can look at pictures of concentration camps and you can say, this is terrible, this is awful, but you can't smell them. It was a stench, it was, it was the smell of death. In the spring of 1945, Herbert Mandel was a soldier in the United States Army, Charlie Battery. His division had just finished fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, the largest and bloodiest battle of World War II. Allied forces pushed the Germans back into their own territory, and the U.S. Army was on the offensive, trying to strike at the heart of German munitions operations. The Ruhr was the big industrial heart of Germany. When it had been reduced to the point where armor uh, couldn't move that far, my battery, Charlie battery, was pulled out and went around the Ruhr into the Hartz Mountains. On April 12, 1945, C battery wasn't being fired upon, so Herb, who was on reconnaissance, was just waiting for some action with some of his fellow soldiers in an open field. I saw, and the others saw, three men in striped suits walk into our position and picking up cigarette butts. One of them had his hand bandaged, and he saw our medic with a red cross on his helmet, and he went over to him. The man spoke no English, but Charlie Battery's sergeant was fluent in Polish. So he called him over, and Sergeant Madge listened to this guy, and he said, my God, we've overrun a concentration camp. What, where is it? Right back there, about 300 yards. We drove past this camp and set up, and the guards took off and there the inmates were. I'll tell you exactly what had happened. April 12th, 1945. Herb had read about concentration camps, but wasn't prepared for what awaited him. I had no idea what it was in the flesh, you know. The division commander said, oh, we got to do something about this because this is appalling and he appointed one of the medical officers to go in and get medical treatment for the inmates, evacuate them and get medical treatment for them. So ambulances started arriving at the camp. The drivers were wearing gas masks. Why? Because of the smell. Six days later, when the German army was almost in total collapse, Herb and his two friends decided to visit the camp. There were still hundreds of people there. An inmate came up to me and asked if I spoke French. Well, I did speak French. I spoke high school French. He became my guide through the camp, our guide. And we gathered about a dozen people around us as we went through the camp, and he told me all about the camp. The camp had been liberated six days. They had been evacuating the worst cases. Even though the worst cases were, in theory, gone, they were still dying. And I saw a pit in which there were Thirteen bodies had, of people who died so far that day. And each day they would bury in the pit those that had died. And then the next day's dead would be placed on top and then they'd be covered. He also told me that 5,000 had died that winter they were digging an underground aircraft factory out of the sandstone there in the Hartz Mountains. As they would die, 
they'd bring in replacements. For the next two hours, Herb and his unit toured the camp they learned was called Blankenstein. What I saw were one-story buildings made of wood. Inside the buildings were bunk beds stacked four high, and each one of those held two people. Those two people shared one blanket over the most severe winter that I've ever experienced. It was one of the worst winters in Europe's history. It was just a miserable winter. Those that were in the bunks were absolutely skeletal. They were lying there and they were just waiting for something to happen, either to be evacuated or to die. The people who could walk walked very slowly. They could just hardly manage to walk. They were all suffering from malnutrition. And furthermore, they had all kinds of illnesses. Herb heard stories from the prisoners of the cruelty of the guards. I got an inkling right from the beginning when this injured inmate went to the medic. Well, what happened to him? What didn't... Well, one of the guards got a hold of this fellow and cut his finger off with a bayonet as a parting shot. That's why his hand was bandaged, bandaged in a piece of filthy cloth. Only 20 years old at the time, the experience left a huge mark on Herb Mandel's life. That experience and the Holocaust in general has had the greatest negative impact on my life more than anything else ever. It is just a horror to contemplate. It goes beyond imagination. And there I saw it with my own eyes. But when Herb first returned home to the United States, he never discussed what he had seen firsthand. Not until just a few years ago, Herb found out his armored field artillery unit was having a reunion. He decided to attend, and there he met a doctor who had served with the battalion. There was this little guy, Dr. Metric. I went up to him and I said, Dr. Metric? He said, yes. I said, my name is Herb Mandel. I'm from the 399th. He said, the 399th? You're the guys that liberated Langenstein. I said, yes, I'm from Charlie Battery. We're the ones that did it. He said, well, I'm the guy that had to evacuate all the inmates of Langenstein and find places where they could be treated. That was my job at that time. Now, here's a little history of Langenstein. As the war was ending and the Germans saw that we were going to not only win, but catch them, Langenstein was ordered evacuated by the Germans. Everybody who could walk was to be marched out, and the others were to be left to die. So the people that we saw at the camp were left to die. 3,000 went out on that march. I don't know how many survived. You know, we can't imagine what these people went through day after day after day, minute by minute, torture. We can't, just can't imagine it, but they did. breaks your heart.
Now Herb Mandel travels to local schools to tell students what he saw, to teach them the lessons of the Holocaust. Never let this happen again. And if there's the slightest inkling of it, fight it tooth and nail. Any attempt to limit the liberties of anyone should be stopped in its tracks. Don't let it happen again.